Um, okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce our last speaker of today's uh, symposium. Uh, so Randy Buckner is professor of psychology and neuroscience at Harvard University. Uh, he's also the director of psychiatric neuroimaging research division and faculty here at the Martinez Center. Uh, something I learned about uh, Randy recently is that he's actually an early adopter of the Seven Desma. Had a lot of stories about some of the early days in Bay Five, and I've heard that he's been coming back uh, to the scanner and he's going to be showing us some of these recent data uh, today. So Randy, thanks so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me. And uh, also, uh, I, I know I'm at the end of the day, so I, I'm going to try to take half of my my allotted time because I'm keeping people from uh, socializing and drinking and eating. Um, but I, I just want to take the opportunity as sort of the, the closer of the session, representing users, just to say how important these efforts are, to, you know, at a deep level for pushing clinical translation, but also the opportunities for us to discover more about the organization of the brain. And, and, and my career, I've been at the Martino Center off and on for, for 25 years, actually could be summarized as, as, as being able to take advantage of and be around these extraordinary um, uh, developments. And I, I've gone back and forth from Boston to St. Louis on a couple occasions. I was originally in St. Louis, came back to Boston, went to St. Louis. And when I came back, one of the most exciting things, I came back in the end of 2005, one of the most exciting things was the push towards high field. But as you know, if you've ever joined a team or maybe as a freshman in a dorm, there's a little bit of hazing that goes on. And so I, I just wanted to mention this. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but um, on the one hand, uh, this is one of our, our early uh, posters where what has been talked about, you can see this, I can't move very far. Uh, the extraordinary opportunity of high field, especially in the domain of functional imaging, because for the first time within individuals, we can see, and what you're seeing here is actually two different stimuli and juxtaposition of high field. You could see the specialization, the anatomical specialization in relation to function. And that was extraordinary to us. We knew we wanted to push the limits of resolution. We knew there was more organization to be discovered, and here is an opportunity to do it. And what what uh, I realized over time is that I, I have suffered on many occasions to be part of these experiments. Uh, I've been burned in pain studies at the Martino Center. I've been partially suffocated in studies of hypercapnia. I've been immobilized for four hours in the 70 on a bite bar. But nothing compares to what was done to me to be able to have the privilege of using these extraordinary coils. and. Um, I don't have time, but I just want to mention one day where Graham Wiggins played, how many times can I quickly pull Randy in and out of the scanner to adjust the coil? For those of you who have been in the 7T scanner, you don't want to go in and out of the field quickly. Um, and I don't know if this is ever fixed, but one of these coils, they, I think they used the first 3T printer to model my head to find the exact spot where you could put a screw that poked a little knob in my head. I think that was the day I was in there for four hours, I'm not sure. But um, I just want to say that it was worth it um, because we've been able to push the limits of these, but um, uh, also it's just fun to think back nostalgically about these early explanations. And you know, when I try to develop this talk about how much I appreciate um, being involved in these efforts and how much important science can be done, I, I, I realized this when I was putting my talk together for a reason you'll see in a second. Um, just by reference, this is my beautiful family. On my backdrop, on my computer for the last decade, while all of them were born and grew, was was this. This is the first seven Tesla function. So actually, I've looked at more functional imaging 7T data for, for longer than I think anybody on the planet because of the consequence of all day, every day, staring at this. And the, and the reason for this is not arbitrary. This is one of our first high field experiments in the AC88 coil where we had just a simple finger tapping task. And it's true for us too. We also worried tremendously about the distortion, the quality of data. And, and surprising to us, but probably because a lot of the efforts in the background, it was extraordinary. You can see the resolution in these images here on, on the backdrop. Like you can see how it uh, follows the sulci and the gyri. And, and this has been on the backdrop because as we push the limits in other domains of functional specialization resolution, this is, this is the goal. Within individual functional specificity at at, at, this, at this level. And for time, I just want to mention what I see as the opportunity, uh, and, and it is to go beyond what the last couple of decades of neuroimaging have largely been about in the field, which I equate to this image here. Um, this is one of our former students 
On average, this is the average face from the movie Black Swan, so it's Natalie Portman-esque. I think when you're doing group averaging, group averaged imaging, you're doing imaging that's equivalent to this face. You learn a lot about the global properties, the shape of a face, the two eyes, the nose, their positions, but you lose a lot of the details. And so the push recently has been to understand organization and use that for translation by going into the details of the individual. And just to illustrate one example um, that stems from the observation that when we started to look at our favorite network, which is a large scale network, it is a large scale network across association cortex. In the literature, it's often called the default network. Don't pay attention to that name. It is a higher order association network that involved in many aspects of cognition. And I'll, uh, and I'll show you in a section, I, th I think this is a proxy for a number of networks. But one, one of our clues that we were missing details came from some of our early 7T experiments. And when you look at the individual subject level, just across subjects, you can see why you would get a group average estimate of a large region, but you can also see the detail that you would just miss off the bat that wasn't going to even be corrected by having high resolution topographic organization of the sulci and gyri. It was at the, at the functional level. And just to give you an example of that, this is from 3T data. Here is the, a group estimate of a large scale network across the brain from a thousand subjects from uh, Thomas's work that you heard uh, earlier. If you go into an individual now, doing something quite painful, scanning that individual 24 times in 3T, something that we can get very rapidly now at 7T. Uh, and you, you ask the question in a single subject, can you recapitulate that network? You can, here's a seed region, the correlation structure using functional connectivity, MRI across the brain. I just want to point out that if you move over a little bit, you get a different network. And at first, that might not seem like it's functionally important, but when you juxtapose them, what you realize is that it might have been the case that at this fictitious group average level, what we are calling a large monolithic network, may have always been multiple functionally specialized networks that were anatomically juxtaposed one next, uh, one next to the other. Um, we've taken this further just to point out why you should pay attention to this kind of organization. We just call these networks A and B, they're in red and, and, and salmon color here. Um, but you could use them to predict functional responses across broad, distinct domains of cognition. For example, if you do that, 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 that network analysis of individuals in, in black outlines here is network A, all these regions in yellow are independent data while people do tasks where they, where they remember what they did, for example, yesterday. And you can see it predicts the distributed topography. Now, if you look at the other network and you have people do social inference tasks, tasks that are called theory of mind, you can show uh, that this other set of regions is activated. That this specialization may have always been present and simply blurred together and missed. These are domains of higher level cognition that we think are disturbed in mental illness, but might reflect in some sense the pinnacle of specialization that occurs across development while you refine these systems in large you know, motifs of organization, fractionating and specializing here, you can capture it in individuals. When you go to 70, the specialization becomes even more exquisite. Here is 70 data we published recently, where you can see in blue and yellow, and one of our key questions was, so this is what I would call a, 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 a warmer, sort of colder experiment. One question was, well, you always get a little bit of overlap, you always get a bit of specialization. As we push the resolution, would things become more separate, or we now identify a region that we really thought were, were hubs of convergence? And this particular uh, set of experiments here is one subject, there are several, uh, as we push this, what we got was more separation, more anatomic specialization, suggesting that we, we were, the hypothesis that these were separate networks all across the brain that became functionally specialized by adulthood uh, was likely to be the case. In fact, uh, at this resolution and with this much data, the overlap is actually quite, quite minimal. Uh, when you go into detail, you can see these network juxtapositions closely interdigitated across sulci and gyri. Um, we, we don't think this is specified genetically or, or predetermined by development. What we suspect is that there's large, more amorphous circuits that are pre-programmed and exist at birth. And as you develop through competitive interactions, there's probably specialization and splits that form. There's lots of precedent for this in the visual system. We think this might be happening all across the brain uh, for systems involved in higher order cognition. This is the first time we can, can see those uh, splits uh, clearly. Um, as we move forward, just thinking about how we could utilize this, I'm excited about the opportunities because it allows us to see 
functional organization in more detail, what can we do with that? I think we saw this today, and just because I mentioned it, I wanted to, to sort of highlight this. I, I think we have not yet utilized the full potential of resolution for the cortex. Actually, Peter Banatini's talk showed off, I think what I'm thinking of here, where using the laminar resolution, or just in some sense, the ability to find scale resolution by taking into account depth, you could probe association cortex as done in working memory. I think we're gonna see a lot more of that adopting some of the strategies used for visual cortex, but all uh, across the brain. One thing that come out, and I put this in before, one thing I think that's gonna come out of this. Um, so uh, uh, Bob and I completely agree of what we should study and we should do with individuals, but we have completely different predictions. I think if we push the resolution and look at the functional organization, the utility of the architectonic area, the historical one, will break down for association cortex completely. And my intuition for that is not, is, is, is not purely based on, uh, on a hypothesis without data, but because we already see that in anatomy. These are architectonic areas in the, in the marmoset. If you're talking about V1 and primary motor cortex, they have all the properties you think about an, uh, an area that we learn about in textbooks. But when you go to these higher order association regions, such as TE3 here, uh, TPO, uh, uh, these regions that are parts of what we think of these higher order association areas where I saw the fractionations, well, you can see even in marmoset anatomy from a, a tracer injection, it splits these areas all over the place and doesn't obey the architectonic boundaries at all. My guess is the architectonic boundaries are getting laid down earlier in development, and a lot of these competitive processes that are specialized in these higher order networks are, are just forming later would be my, my guess. Uh, but what I can't say, I can't say it's even from anatomy, we know that it splits these areas and not in some ways. The, uh, uh, posterior part of this particular tectonic area is part of a completely different set of networks going to visual cortex. This anterior portion is part of higher order transmodal networks. And I think for the first time we could push that resolution and start to see the organizational properties. And I think the aerial distinctions and association cortex, what we'll learn are going to break down. So we both agree on the experiment. We don't agree on the outcome. Um, the other thing is, and we started to see some of this and the spinal cord, I think is just a wonderful talk. It was an excellent body of work, which sort of, uh, uh, this is just another example of, I think we're going to start to see a lot of work that moves beyond the cortex, the thalamus, sphagnum, and cerebellum, uh, regions that are important for, for pathology, but have been a little bit elusive just because they're beyond the resolution and uh, boundary of 1.5 or 3T. My, one of the structures I've studied extensively here is a network uh, organizational analysis and an individual, I don't want to talk about the, what these colors mean, but here's a projection and estimate of the dominant regions in the cerebellum that couple. This is in 3T data in individuals. This particular individual was scanned 30 times on 30 different days to, to get the signal to noise. And in, at 3T, the resolution is just not sufficient yet to make the distinction we want to in the cerebellum to see the organization. What we've learned in studying the cerebellum over the last decade is all the things we need just a little bit more resolution to resolve. And so I think if we move into the 7T data, this is actually some data that uh, John uh, helped me collect uh, uh, a few months ago. Uh, uh, it's actually very tricky to get high resolution functional data in the cerebellum uh, because of so many different effects that are non-uniform across the brain that sort of the cerebellum has been uh, the least privileged uh, to benefit from. But we can get very good high resolution data and map it onto exquisite structural data at 70 within individuals. And this is the kind of data that I think is just going to be an engine for further refinement uh, uh, going forward. And so with that, I'll, I'll just end and thank the community. Um, uh, when, you, when I show an image like this, which is an action shot, I, I joke when we were doing our first, getting our first cerebellar pilot data uh, uh, with John that we had to take a picture of it just in case anything came of it. Nothing's come of it yet. Um, but uh, uh, what I think is, is sort of quiet about this image, which I think we saw today, is just how much goes on behind the scenes down to becoming a, you know, a middle market person for, uh, for helium uh, that's required to keep this scanner up and running and the myriad of different technologies that went into this over a decade, over many different laboratories, over collaborations between industry and academia. And so when we see these kinds of data, I guess as a user uh, uh, at the end of this scene, with the now enabled with the ability to do it, probe a new structure in a way that we hadn't been able to before, I think it's, sort of a quiet image. It doesn't reflect the turbulence sort of that and the, the history, but I, we saw that today. And so I want to end on that point to thank the community 
for enabling these technologies, and they've definitely helped our work, my laboratory's work, my students' work. Uh, but uh, there's just so much that goes into uh, a study like that. And so I will end early uh, so we can get some drinks. And I just wanted to thank uh, individuals in my laboratory, but also just the, the 17 community more broadly. Thank you.